Recently, the carnivore diet has become quite popular, thanks in part to the famous University of Toronto professor Jordan Peterson, as well as his daughter Michaela having used this meat-only diet to alleviate certain health issues. And she said to me, um, quit eating greens. And I thought, oh, really? I'm eating cucumbers, lettuce, broccoli, and chicken and beef. It's like, I have to cut out the goddamn greens? It's like, within a week, I was 25% less anxious in the morning. Within two weeks, 75%, and I've been better every single day. Uh, disclaimer number two, I am not recommending right. this to anyone. Needless to say, this diet steps on a lot of toes, especially if you happen to advocate for a plant-based diet. Even if you're on a low-carb or keto diet, this might sound extreme considering you can't even have avocados or macadamia nuts. Dr. Sean Baker, a big carnivore diet advocate, has been on the diet for about seven years and runs a website called meatheals.com. As of August the 26th, 99 people have shared their stories of how they improved their health by eating only meat healing things like depression, various gut issues, and rheumatoid arthritis. With 77 of them experiencing weight loss, 61 of them commenting on improved mood, and 31 people seeing improvements in their skin. And there are plenty more stories to be found elsewhere on the internet. So whatever diet camp you happen to be in, investigating why this diet seems to help people could provide some useful information that you may apply to your own diet, even if you have no intention of eating a bunch of meat. In this video, we'll look at nutrients, fiber, and why a lack of plants may help some people. The first concern you may have is, won't you get scurvy or some vitamin deficiencies? In the 1960 book, The Fat of the Land by Wilhelmer Stefansson, he describes his experience living with the Inuit of Canada beginning in 1910. He explained that if meat needs carbohydrates and other vegetable additives to make it wholesome, then the poor Eskimos should have been in wretched state. But to the contrary, they seemed to me the healthiest people I had ever lived with. He also said that the Inuit remained completely scurvy free, except for a few who worked for white men and ate their food. First of all, certain animal parts like the liver do contain vitamin C, so you could simply eat some of the liver, or if you're more adventurous, the adrenal gland, brain, and spinal cord of animals are high in vitamin C. But it seems that some of the recent advocates of the carnivore diet are scurvy free and doing just fine while rarely consuming organ meats. It was discovered by Birch and Dan in 1953 that even the skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle of animal meat contains vitamin C. But that's somehow been forgotten. However, is this small amount enough? An interesting thing to consider is that your body works differently on this type of diet. Because glucose, carbohydrate, and vitamin C are structured similarly, they actually compete for glucose transporters. So too much glucose can inhibit vitamin C transport. Simply put, the less glucose you consume, the more efficiently you can utilize vitamin C. So the less vitamin C you require. The near zero carb nature of the carnivore diet should help people maintain proper levels of other nutrients as well. This paper, looking at 50 people doing a paleolithic ketogenic diet, found that all but one person had adequate levels of magnesium without supplementation. Considering up to 50% of Americans are magnesium deficient, this is significant. The study also found that the lower people's glucose, the better their magnesium levels. Other studies have found glucose to lower levels of plasma potassium, so the carnivore diet should also help maintain good potassium levels. Here's a sample day of carnivore eating. Beef, beef liver, egg yolks, gouda cheese, and clams. I'm not saying this is the ideal mix of foods, but it will easily cover pretty much all of your recommended daily intakes. Magnesium and potassium seem pretty low, but as I just mentioned, the nature of the carnivore diet should have you doing fine on the relatively low dietary levels of magnesium and potassium. And we'll get to fiber in a minute, but insoluble fiber can bind to magnesium, so the lack of fiber in this diet can actually help with magnesium status. Nonetheless, if you experience cramping after the adaptation period, you might want to supplement these minerals or get your levels checked. Also, 70 grams of salmon roe or just 2 teaspoons of cod liver oil will easily cover vitamin E and D and boost your vitamin A. If you don't want dairy in your diet, you can get more vitamin K2 from grass-fed beef tallow. And you'd want to make sure to supplement in more fat from tallow or bone marrow anyway. Also, I would really recommend wild-caught or pasture-raised animals eating a natural, nourishing diet, and be wary of fish oil oxidation. But wait a minute. 
Thiamin is looking a little low, at just 54% of the RDI. This brings us to another example of more efficient usage of nutrients on this diet. As Dr. Chris Masterjohn explains in this video of his, Burning carbohydrate for energy requires twice as much thiamine as fat. So you can expect your requirements for thiamine to be drastically lower and easier to meet on this diet. The next concern you may have about this diet is whether you could actually make any progress on the toilet. After all, it's common knowledge that fiber is necessary for preventing constipation. And people have been frightened by the ill effects of constipation for literally thousands of years. A paper by James Wharton states that as far back as the 16th century BC, an Egyptian pharmaceutical papyrus, the Ebers Papyrus, explains that constipation could lead to the poisoning of the body by material released from the decomposing waste in the intestines. This theoretical condition was called auto-intoxication, and it influenced medicine for more than three millennia. As James Wharton says, this fear of auto-intoxication led to the marketing of all kinds of anti-constipation foods and drugs in the early 1900s, when literally hundreds of brands of bowel cleansers competed for consumer dollars. But jump forward to 2011, despite bowel irregularity occurring in 15% of adults and 9% of children, this preface to best practice and research clinical gastroenterology says, our understanding of the pathophysiology of constipation, both in pediatric and adult populations, remains primitive. But I thought the cure for constipation was obvious. The makers of brand cereal have been telling us with their television commercials starting in the 1950s to just chuck some fiber down there. Kellogg's Cracklin brand. High fiber, good taste. It helps keep you fit inside. Fit inside. Try this. Mmm. Bowling blood. Sounds delicious. Nutrition experts recommend increasing your dietary fiber intake as a drug-free way to promote regularity. A few weeks ago, I was having problems staying regular. But is fiber really the answer? When we have a look at the current governmental advice, they consider that fiber is the best available treatment for constipation. But this opinion doesn't bear scientific scrutiny. Dr. Paul Mason presents here a case-controlled study that looks at 63 patients with constipation and high and low fiber diets were compared in them. And this also included a zero fiber diet that required the complete cessation of all vegetables, cereals, fruits, and rice. As we can see, people experienced worsened symptoms on a high fiber diet. Then on a reduced fiber diet, people experienced a modest reduction in symptoms. So the question is, what happened to those on the zero fiber diet? This is not a mistake. I didn't just forget to put something in the slide there. <laughs> not one patient on the zero fiber diet had any symptoms. And these findings were highly statistically significant, highly. Every single person in the low zero fiber group ended up having one bowel action per day, every day. Those in the high fiber group, one bowel action on average every 6.83 days. Now, herbivores eat a huge amount of fiber without getting constipated, but their digestive tract is designed for this. They generally have much bigger cecums for fermenting the fiber. And for some people, fiber may seem to help get things going, but it also increases your need to have bowel movements, as you've added more indigestible material that needs to be expelled. This might not be enough for you to challenge fiber's rule over the bowel, so I recommend watching the full talk by Dr. Paul Mason, or reading the book Fiber Menace by Konstantin Monastirsky. Now, at this point, you may be worried about the gut microbiome. Wouldn't cutting out fiber kill off all our good bacteria? Not necessarily. Bacteria have specific conditions for their growth. Some prefer oxygen, some don't. Some like fiber, some don't, and so on. This study found that Canadian Arctic Inuit still maintain a diverse microbiome, but they do have lower diversity in the Prevotella bacteria. Prevotella has been shown to improve glucose metabolism, meaning their diet may worsen their glucose metabolism a bit, but remember, they hardly consume any glucose in the first place. And Prevotella is actually linked to chronic inflammatory conditions, such as arthritis. In any case, as Dr. Paul Mason points out, research is really not at a point to make definitive claims about fiber causing changes in the microbiome that are necessary for good health. However, it is apparent that nuking your microbiome with antibiotics is very likely a bad idea. When I first heard about this diet, I wasn't surprised that some people had benefits, 
After all, the diet cuts out processed food, wheat, soy, sugar, and vegetable oils. Zero fiber is one thing, but what really surprised me was that people were experiencing improvements after going from simply meat and greens to eating just meat. So why would cutting out greens from an already clean diet help? Well, it comes down to a simple fact of biology. Living things really don't like being eaten. Just like a gazelle has predators, so do plants. But none attacks its prey with more fury than the seaweed shark. A gazelle can run away to avoid being eaten, but what can a plant do when a bug or human shows up? While we are masters of locomotion, plants are fantastic chemists. I'm talking about secondary metabolites, or plant toxins. One of the perks of us humans being intelligent is that we've learned to avoid the highly poisonous plants and have developed methods for deactivating the toxins of others. Though in certain cases, some people can have problems with plant food toxins which don't affect the rest of the population. For example, I grew up in the heat of Texas, yet never had any problems with the photosensitizers in lime or celery. Unfortunately, these poor girls did, experiencing second degree burns from limes. Photosensitizers, technically called furanocoumarins, are toxins in plants that make animals and humans sensitive to light. And virtually all plant foods we normally consume have some level of defense against plant eaters. According to this 1990 paper titled Dietary Pesticides 99% All Natural, led by biochemist Bruce N. Ames, 99% of the pesticides in the American diet are chemicals that plants produce to defend themselves. Only 52 natural pesticides have been tested in high-dose animal cancer tests, and about half, 27, are rodent carcinogens. These 27 are shown to be present in many common foods. The paper goes on to list 57 different plant foods with these carcinogens. And Table 1 identifies 49 natural pesticides and metabolites found in cabbage alone. Now, before it sounds like I'm saying shopping in the produce section is slowly killing you, let me point out that we're not rats and hormesis has to be taken into account. Hormesis is essentially the concept of a good stress, that is, the dose makes the poison, or what harms me in the right way and not too much makes me stronger. For example, just like you or me, broccoli really doesn't like to be chewed on. So when broccoli is cut or chomped on, glucoraphanin in the broccoli is activated through an enzyme myrosinase to form an isothiocyanate, a toxin called sulforaphane. This molecule is designed to kill small living creatures, but for us, it can be good. It's a mild stress that our bodies gear up for, and the end result is we wind up stronger. Dr. Rhonda Patrick has an extensive video explaining the vast and impressive potential benefits of this compound, everything from preventing cancers, ameliorating existing cancers, to lowering inflammation and preventing cognitive decline. But we can't say all the defense mechanisms of every plant food result in a hormetic effect for everyone. This table, from a presentation done by Dr. Mayalan Fontes, shows a couple different types of bioactive plant compounds that can be damaging. One is the anti-nutrient phytic acid, or phytates, which come from grains, nuts, and legumes, and bind to nutrients like calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium, manganese, and zinc, making them less absorbable. But the phytic acid doesn't just impair you from absorbing the nutrients in the seed itself, it also impairs absorption of nutrients from other foods you eat. For example, as this study found, when you consume zinc-rich oysters with black beans, you'll absorb about half of that zinc. And when you consume them with corn tortillas, you'll absorb almost none of that zinc. Another substance found in common plant food with low level toxicity is oxalate. It's found in bran, beets, rhubarb, soy, blueberries, lime peel, orange peel, nuts, and several other things. Since oxalate is usually more concentrated in the leaves of plants, spinach is particularly high in it. According to Hayshek and Rousseau's Handbook of Toxicologic Pathology, insoluble plant oxalates include calcium oxalate. When animals eat these plants, the crystals are immediately irritating, causing mechanical damage to the oral cavity and gastrointestinal tract. Obviously, the levels in food that we normally eat are way too low to cause any immediately apparent effects, but high levels of oxalate are no joke. In 1989, a 53-year-old diabetic alcoholic man died just a few hours after having 6 grams worth of oxalate from sorrel soup. This is the equivalent of about a half kilo of spinach. However, keep in mind this person was already severely metabolically impaired. 
about 2.5 kilos or 5.5 pounds of spinach if you can fit it into your stomach, has a 50% chance of killing a healthy person. However, as Sally Norton argues in this talk, while the oxalate levels found in food may not produce any quickly apparent effects, problems can arise when you repeatedly expose yourself to oxalates through your diet by eating things like spinach, almonds, and cashews. You can easily exceed your tolerance for oxalate even though it looks like your kidneys are just fine, and that 4% of what you're eating is being retained in tissues left behind causing issues. Tiny oxalate crystals can accumulate in the body, and you can find them in the bone, the skin, and the glands. Accumulation in the thyroid impairs thyroid function, accumulation in the breast has been linked to cancer, and accumulation in the kidneys leads to kidney stones. 70 to 80% of all kidney stones are made of calcium oxalate. So if you have kidney stones, poor kidney function, or poor thyroid function, you may feel better on a low, under 50 milligram oxalate diet. This means no more than six leaves of spinach a day. There's all kinds of secondary metabolites we could talk about, but the point is plants really don't want you to eat them, and these defense mechanisms are in virtually every single plant food. The gliadin protein in wheat disrupts the physical barrier of the gut, causing inflammation. Protease inhibitors in things like grains, nuts, and seeds, and soy inhibit some of the enzymes that help us digest protein. Soy also contains phytoestrogens, which bind to estrogen receptors and cause hormonal issues. Goitrogens are found in soy, other legumes, and cruciferous vegetables, and hamper thyroid health. Saponins, which are found in soy, beans, peas, lentils, and other legumes, are used as emulsifiers in the food and cosmetic industry, and can cause damage to the gut lining, making it more permeable or leaky. There's also a huge variety of plant lectins that some people can be very sensitive to. But of course, there are tons of studies talking about the vast benefits of all kinds of plant compounds, and a lot of people seem to thrive on a plant-based diet. So it surely comes down to how each person responds to these substances. One level of a secondary metabolite from plants may be a beneficial hormetic stress for one person, while at the same time being a detrimental toxin for another person. When dealing with some chronic ailment, many people try several different elimination diets to find out what's triggering their symptoms. So if you suspect you have some sensitivity, you could just do all the elimination diets at once and add foods back in later. The carnivore diet happens to be a low lectin, low FODMAP, low sulfite, low oxalate, low salicylate, low phytate, super low carb, and no fiber diet. I haven't heard any negative stories about people doing this. Um, well, I have a negative story. One of the things that both Michaela and I noticed was that when we restricted our diet and then ate something we weren't supposed to, the reaction was absolutely catastrophic. Now, this video only scratches the surface of this diet. There's still many things to discuss, like nutrient density and bioavailability. But surely one key factor in why many people are experiencing improvements is this meat-only diet acts like the ultimate elimination diet. This video was sponsored by Brilliant, which is a great resource for those of you interested in physics, math, or want to get started in computer science. These math-related subjects can really be a source of anxiety for many people, so much so that a 2012 study found that math anxiety is a lot like physical pain to the brain. Yet, Brilliant has somehow managed to make learning these subjects feel less like I'm Miles Teller in the movie Whiplash, and more like I'm just enjoying a puzzle. Brilliant is a website about problem solving that teaches you to think critically, logically, and mathematically. There are all kinds of topics broken up into bite-sized concepts with challenging quizzes to get you to apply the knowledge you just picked up. And the quizzes are actually challenging and get you thinking. It was really rewarding to have to stop and wrap my head around the wiki they have to figure out the answer to this question in the computational biology course. As you go from course to course and move from the foundational level to the advanced level, you'll develop more and more confidence in thinking in a way that daily life doesn't usually require. To support this channel and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org W-I-L and sign up for free. And the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription.